Well, um, I rise to say genuinely thank you very much to all members for coming here on a one-line whip Thursday after a long and hard uh, few weeks of Brexit debates. And I do want to again pay tribute to the Honourable Ladies for securing what I think has been a really, really high-quality debate, some excellent speeches, some excellent suggestions. And I will try and pay tribute as we go through to some of the main points. Um, and of course, there were so many good questions that I'm not sure I will be able to respond to, to all of them. But I'm very happy to respond if any, um, any colleague wants to stop me or ask in writing on some very specific points. But um, essentially, what a joy it was, Madam Deputy Speaker, to debate, as I think my honourable friend, the member for Richmond Park, said, something that will affect us all for the next 30 years rather than the next three years, something that is actually so fundamental to the way we live our lives that it deserves much more time in this place and much more discuss discussion outside it. And I would be delighted to spend many more hours in this place, uh, on the front benches or wherever, uh, debating these particular issues. I will give way. I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. I entirely agree with everything she's just said about the importance of this, and perhaps you just agree that when 72% of the public have expressed, I think in an opinion poll, um, that they uh, are either very or fairly concerned about climate change, that the more time we spend talking about it here would be welcomed by them as well as us. There will be many, many groups out there waiting to see what we say today, including uh, those young people who took to the streets with great energy and verve, an absolutely amazing thing to see. And I did note uh, the Honourable Lady for Oxford and West Abingdon's comments when she laid this debate, saying that she was very supportive, but as a teacher, she was a little concerned about them doing it because it would have annoyed me in your physics classes. Well, I'm afraid she probably would have been cross with me if she'd been my teacher, because I fear I would have been out there with them at their age. But of course, I was studying geography and meteorology, not physics. Um, so, but what I did want to, uh, to say uh, was a couple of points. First is, where are we? Secondly, uh, why we need to do more, and thirdly, why I think this is so incredibly important. And I, by the way, I do welcome a really, I think, collegial cross-party tone. There were some political digs. I'm not going to get into political point scoring here, because actually, unless we pull together on this, we will not make progress. This has to be a cross-government, cross-party, global initiative, and we need to have a lot more consensus than we have had. But I will say, following the last excellent debate, happy St David's Day for tomorrow to the very, very many Welsh members, but actually as members of all four nations, nations in this country, we, in this great group, we can take pride in the UK's record in tackling climate change. We were amongst the first to recognise the problem. Indeed, Mrs Thatcher spoke about the impact of human uh, activity on the climate back in the UN in 1989. Sir Nicholas Stern's incredible work in 2006 laid a pathway for how we had to think about the problem. We used cross-party strength in this place to pass the world's first Climate Change Act. 10 years ago, I am, the, I think, probably one of the a tiny number of ministers that actually has statutory binding carbon budgets advice, uh, given to us by the CCC, upon which we have to agree, who has to then defend those budgets and the record on those budgets to the House of Commons. And it's worth noting, as others have, that uh, we are on target uh, to drop our carbon emissions by 57% by 2032. Uh, of course, we need to get to 80% by 2050. Some will say, well, you'll keep, you know, we haven't yet uh, set out exactly how we're going to get to those targets. Uh, we, we published the Clean Growth Strategy, I think, the most comprehensive document I have ever seen from a government setting out policies and proposals to decarbonise right across our economy and I'm happy to say that we have delivered uh, almost all of the action points and commitments that we've made so far. We know we have to do more and we will do more and we actually have to go further than those budgets which I think is the point of the, the debate today. We were also the first major industrialised nation briefly of course. I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend. She and I have often discussed the question but I hope she will acknowledge that the provision of the basic charging infrastructure on the trunk road network now proposed by NGC is a huge step forward because if we can cure range anxiety for electric vehicles, we might see a tipping point which would have a big effect even on the things which uh, the right honourable member, the former Secretary of State for Energy, uh, mentioned. I think my right honourable friend makes the point very, uh, very well about some of the things that government can actually do. So much of this is a combination of the public and private sector working together, but there are absolutely parts of the equation where government can and must lead through legislation, through incentive, uh, so, and I, I entirely agree. Um, 
May, may I, I do just want to try, I will of course try and take as many interventions, but I do want to respond to some of the points that were made. Um, I was making the point that after this very startling IPCC report, very, very worrying, we were the first developed country to actually ask for advice on how we will achieve that. We've asked for how, we've asked for by when, and we've asked how much it is going to cost, because we have to be pragmatic about this. We have to recognise the need for urgency, but we cannot bring, bring forward policies and proposals that do not command the support of people we represent. We can see what happens uh, just across the channel, what happens when we do that. And um, I will give, uh, give way briefly, yes. While she's on the, the targets and the, um, the request for the CCT to comment on, on, on net zero, would it be possible for the CCT to recommend a, a new target of net zero for 2050 uh, following her letter? Because, of course, their current advice is that it is not technically possible. And so what I've asked them to do is to set out very clearly when they think we should be able to achieve this, and I look forward to sharing that information with the House, and I think a debate would be very appropriate. But it's not just actions and policies and words, it is actually delivery. So, as others have noticed, uh, the PwC have said that the UK is at the top of the G20 leaderboard in this space. Since 1990, we have cut emissions uh, by more than any other developed country as, uh, as, a, as a proportion of our economic growth. And the the reason that's important is the best way to cut emissions is to have recessions, which is not a good thing for the prosperity and the future of our constituents. And I think it's extremely important, therefore, um, that we, we – I will give way, very, uh, give way just in a moment – that we recognise uh, that progress, we celebrate that progress, but we do com commit ourselves to do more. I will give way. Away. My, my question really was what does our position look like on that league table if we were to take into account consumption emissions and my general point would be that although she says that we can't go faster than the country as a whole wants us to do there is also a role for government to show real leadership yeah. and the way to do that is to make sure that social justice is at the heart of the approach to climate and that way you don't have the problem with the gilets jaunes. She makes an important point. Of course, the role of government is to set ambition and lead. And I do want to pay tribute to my, right, my honourable friend who was on the desk earlier, uh, the member for Ryslip, Northwood and Pinner, who, along with many other members in this place and all parties, have contributed so much of their time and ingenuity over the last few years to actually come up with these policies and, and produce. And I accept her point about the calculation, but that is the basis on which that chart is calculated. So all countries are having their consumption emissions, uh, if you like, uh, on the honourable lady's point, not necessarily allocated, but the point is on that basis we have led the world, and that is something that we should absolutely focus on. Um, I will talk about some of the other things that we've delivered, things I would hope the Honourable Lady would feel pleased about for once. Last year was a record year for re generation of power from renewables. We were at 32 per cent. She's heckling like one of the, the gilets jaunes. I wish she would listen and behave like the elder stateswoman she could be. We've had the world's, floatest, world's first floating offshore wind platform in operation. We've set out an auction structure uh, for, for offshore wind. We Offshore, offshore wind is actually rather important in decarbonising our energy. And we had the first set of coal-free days since the Industrial Revolution in our energy generation, which has allowed us to take global leadership in the Powering Past Coal Alliance to encourage now 80 other countries, states, cities and companies to operate in a coal-free way. And we ask, I'll give way briefly to the Honourable Lady. Uh, it is short of time, and whilst I recognise all of those achievements, would she not agree with me that if we're really going to meet the highest possible necessary carbon neutral targets, we need to be investing more and more in renewables and less and less on fossil fuels. And that is why I'm about to bring forward the offshore wind sector deal that sets out how we will continue to drive that capacity, why we are spending almost £6 billion over the course of this Parliament. on how, please, I would just love to make some progress because I've only got three minutes. I do want to let the Honourable Lady who called no, this debate... Well, it. Well, <laughs> OK, so having given way very generously, I will say this, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I en entirely accept the challenge of working farther and faster. We must keep keep leading from the front so we can avoid the climate catastrophe that others have been eloquent about. We must find the new opportunities that this transition prevents. We must repair our ecosystems and so we can look the next generation in the eye and say that we did what we had to do to protect our planet for your future. We protected planet A because there is no planet B. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.